Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I hope everybody out there can hear us and please let us know. We're going to watch the comments just for a second to make sure that everybody can hear. Uh, I'm Andrew Dalton. I'm the director of the Adams County Historical Society here in Gettysburg, and uh, we're really excited for this special program tonight. We've done uh, several Ask a Historian programs in the past, and usually Tim and I have, have done it. We did some of the programs through COVID when we had our regular weekly Thursday night uh, events. Uh, but tonight we're joined by two other incredible historians, and I'll introduce them in just a minute. It looks like the sound is good and people can hear us. That's wonderful. Um, so we have crammed ourselves into a pretty small room here at the Adams County Historical Society in Gettysburg. Some of you probably know we're in an old Victorian house and we have literally millions of historic items, uh, records, diaries, newspaper articles, uh, photographs, artifacts, everything you could possibly imagine. It's the entire preserved legacy of the place that you all love so much, Gettysburg and Adams County, Pennsylvania. Um, so thank you for, for being with us tonight. Um, we're going to try to take as many of your questions as we can. I see there's quite a few people joining us already, and that's just wonderful. Uh, thanks for letting us know where you're tuning in from this evening. Um, I also want to thank the Dobbin House Tavern for sponsoring all of our programs this year. And uh, there's a special opportunity tonight. If you donate via the uh, budget at the bottom of the post, we actually have a match up to $1,863. So I'm sure you can figure out um, why that number is significant, and especially to the topic this evening. Um, but uh, I'll just do a quick introduction of our speakers. But before that, I want to plug one more event. Tomorrow is the Adams County Giving Spree. It's a wonderful uh, philanthropic event where people get together and support all the nonprofits in our community. The Historical Society is participating. Uh, tonight at the end of the video, we're going to post the link to the Giving Spree page. Beginning at midnight, you can donate um, and it's really great because it benefits all the nonprofits, but also there's a match pool. So your, your dollars, just like the match that we have tonight, are going to be uh, doubled. Uh, so I hope you'll participate one way or another and help us support uh, the preservation of all these incredible historic materials that we're, we've been entrusted with. And of course, we're building a new building that you you may have heard about. Uh, it'll be located just north of town. It'll be a, a, a museum, a research center, an archive, um, and a big event center so that we can do programs like this, but actually in front of uh, all of the wonderful supporters that we have out there from around the country. So thanks for being here tonight. Uh, we're going to, uh, like I said, this is a program we'd like you to engage with us and ask questions, and uh, we'll do our best to field them uh, with our expert panel. Uh, and so we have Tim Smith, our historian, who you've seen many times before. Uh, he's the author of 10 books about the Battle of Gettysburg and Adams County. He's been a licensed battlefield guide since 1992 for over 30 years. Um, and now he's actually working on creating this new museum for the Historical Society that we're going to be telling you more about in the months ahead. Uh, then Sue Boardman at the other end of the table. She's been a licensed battlefield guide since 2001 for over 20 years now. Uh, she's the author of three books and probably the leading expert in the world on the Gettysburg Cyclorama painting, which is just such a fascinating topic in and of itself. And last but certainly not least, in the, the center of the panel here tonight, we have William A. Frazzanito, um, one of the most preeminent, preeminent historians out there regarding Civil War history and Civil War photography. Um, he's written seven books about Civil War photography, um, and one book of those seven is actually about the photographic history of the town of Gettysburg, the Gettysburg Bicentennial Album which was published in collaboration with the Historical Society. But uh, Bill's work really speaks for itself, and he has inspired hundreds, if not thousands, of other historians and scholars and, and battlefield buffs um, who come here and explore battlefields all around the country using Bill's research and his books as their guide. So uh, it's just so great to have three good friends here, uh, in addition to colleagues. They're, they're people I've known for a long time, and, and we're all excited about answering some of your questions tonight. So um, please let us know. You know, We're going to, I think, start the conversation with with one question just to kick things off to give you an idea of the topic. And this is a, quest a question that uh, Tim brought to my attention earlier. And uh, I, I think it's a good, a good place to start. Do you have a favorite photograph of the Gettysburg battlefield? And, and what is that? Why don't we start with Sue? With me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, as you probably know, I have quite a collection. So you're asking me to choose one of about yes. 2,500. Do I have a favorite? <laughs> Yes, um, and it's not what you would expect. William Tipton took an awful lot of photographs of monuments, and he had an early series of the early monuments on the battlefield, and then he had all the way up to the turn of the century. So uh, it was through him 
and an early photograph that I discovered that the 147th Regimental Monument, which is the group I follow and research, had an earlier monument. And not only did he have an earlier monument, but, but they took their original one and moved it somewhere else. And through Tipton's photography, that was my discovery. Wow, that's amazing. What year was the photograph? The photograph, the original one was 1885. Okay. And then the new one, of course, was 1889. Right. And so he took both of them, but it's obviously, you know, the same rock, same place, different wow. monument. Yeah, that's amazing. What about you, Bill? Did when, Especially when you were younger, did you have a, a photograph that really stood out to you? The photo that I would have to uh, mention is because of uh, the personal impact my research had on this photograph. It was traditionally called Dead of the 24th Michigan at McPherson's Woods on the first day's battlefield. And I first got to see that photograph in a book I got for my 10th birthday. And um, little did I realize that I would eventually be able to link that photo, which shows bodies in a V formation with a whole series of other photographs. And I was able to determine that there were no fewer than 10 photographs of dead bodies all taken at one spot on the battlefield. But the traditional captions never combined one photo with another photo and placed the individual views at four different locations on the 25 square miles. So as a kid, I realized that at least three of those captions were wrong. And anyway, this began the research project that eventually led to my March 10th, 1967 discovery that all the dead were taken at a, one of the most obscure parts of the battlefield, a place where no one dreamed any of the photos were taken, no less all of them, a place that was literally or roughly three miles from McPherson's woods. And wow. this changed my life. I knew I had a book at this point. And uh, had I not made that discovery, um, uh, I might have just gotten into the history field as a, well, I, I really, um, I didn't, the idea of teaching sounded kind of <laughs> repetitive and boring. I, I always, even as a kid, um, I, uh, I had relatives that lived in Florida and we used to visit them. The first trip was in 1954. The second trip was in 1957. I was 10 going on 11. And by 57, I was getting interested in the Civil War. And I bought my first relics on, on the way back in Virginia. And I've been interested in artifacts ever since, uh, photographs, uh, all kinds of different artifacts. And I decided that I was fascinated by history, but the idea of teaching didn't sound that challenging. So I decided I was gonna go into the museum field. And that's why I got my master's degree in history museum administration at Cooperstown. Right, wow. And I could go on and on. <laughs> I'm sure we'll get to even more. That, that's an incredible story though. I, and I'm sure many of you have read Bill's books and, and seen these photos. They're some of the most iconic photographs ever taken um, during the entire American Civil War. And uh, finding the actual location where those images were recorded is probably, if not the, the most consequential and, <laughs> discovery. And people didn't, people didn't even realize that the captions were wrong. Right, yeah. right, they were yeah. published that way. What about Tim, do you have, before we get into other questions, uh, do you have any a favorite photographs? Well, you know, there are many photographs. Um, I'm sure we could all cite as our favorite photograph, but I'm gonna have to choose uh, the dead sharpshooter at Devil's Den. <laughs> and uh, one of the reasons for this is uh, I am not aware of when it was the first time I actually saw that photograph. It's just something that was always with me. I know that I was in the library in like first grade and the other kids were over at the children's section and I pulled a Civil War book off the shelf and I saw it in that book. So um, I, it's something that has always been with me. My dad had Viewmasters and I had his collection of Viewmasters and I don't know exactly when it was, but I got a Civil War series of three Viewmaster. Um, and, and that one was in there. And I so I had seen it in stereo as it was meant to be viewed early on. And then, of course, whenever we came to Gettysburg for the first time, I went there to that site and saw that image. And you could argue I've always been enamored by Devil's Den. And what's really interesting on what Bill said is, I think I also realized that 
what do you do if you're interested in history, but you are not going to be a teacher? Um, you think about it, and there's not many other ways, you know, besides museum, curatorial uh, services, you can get into it. And I, I, I realized at some point that you could move to Gettysburg <laughs> and you could make a living in the Civil War living in Gettysburg, whether it would be working in a Civil War relic shop. I worked in a relic shop for a while, or of course, becoming a licensed battlefield guide and giving people tours of the battlefield, which you could argue is kind of like teaching anyway. Kind of. But um, uh, so Gettysburg was a way for me, who was really into history and really into the Battle of Gettysburg to make a living without being a teacher also. <laughs> We're well, not anti-teacher. No. No, no. What's really funny about that is, of course, kids, eighth graders come to Gettysburg. And, you know, for many, many years, that's all I did was school buses. I might have done like a hundred eighth grade school buses a year, but I only have the kids for two hours at a time. And no grades. That's right. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. We're getting so many comments and, and I'm trying to keep up with all of them. Also so many donations. And that means a lot to us for those of you who've tuned in since the beginning, we do have a match tonight of $1,863. So we're hoping we can get that full match. Uh, it's a, a great number to, to pick for tonight's program. Um, I'll just throw out a couple more questions, whoever wants to take them. Uh, the first is have the three Confederate prisoners in the famous photograph on Seminary Ridge been identified? No. Okay. And, uh, you know, part of the issue with this, and uh, I'm sure Bill could talk about this also, um, is over the years, the photograph of the three Confederate prisoners on Seminary Ridge has been identified in books and uh, at the Library of Congress, um, uh, yeah, in the Library of Congress library, uh, there is a identification given to it. And of course, much more recently, uh, when a Gettysburg uh, a stamp came out, um, the three Confederate prisoners were identified um, in some literature put up by the post office. But all the identifications that have given been given to the Confederates in that photograph are massive speculation and not <laughs> based on any source. Somebody has just said, oh, you know, and they identified them. Um, it's kind of uh, lengthy and hard to get into, but um, the post office identification of them, I think um, uh, one of the guys they identified is actually killed at Chancellorsville. And, um, uh, you know, uh, the other guy was like, it was like a father and son. It, it just didn't match at all. But people, here's the issue, I guess. People have seen that photograph. People have come forward and people have said, oh, that's my great, great grandfather. And they've identified people in that <laughs> photograph. And then, and Bill, you probably remember at the Library of Congress, um, it was identified as some Louisiana tigers on the back. Do you remember how? And then that got into several books. Do you remember that story? Not really. Okay, <laughs> okay. but uh, yes, uh, people say they knew who they are. But you know, you got to consider that you got some people to photograph. Um, millions of men served in the American Civil War armies, and well, in the Confederate Army. I mean, we're uh, okay. It can be. You can probably hone it down to like. Um, 50,000 people that it could be. Yeah, you know, I mean, it would really be really difficult. And okay, they're captured. Maybe you can get it, you know, down to a little less, but. Uh, well, that's um, the same way with the dead sharpshooter in Devil's Head. It's exactly I've the same him, way as the dead sharpshooter. I've seen him identified at least four different the ways. The best example we could, yes, the dead sharpshooter Devil's Head, I was just talking about, has it been identified as, I believe, four different individuals? The first time it happened was in Civil War um, Confederate Veteran magazine. Confederate Veteran in, um, I don't remember the date off the top of my head, but <laughs> it was identified as a guy named um, Hodges. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, a lady saw the photograph, said, you know, my son was killed at the Battle of Gettysburg. Somebody showed her the photograph. Oh, my God, that's my son. But Hodges was in the second or the 4th Virginia Infantry on Culp's Hill yeah, in the Stonewall idea. Brigade. So certainly he was killed on Culp's Hill and that was not him in that photograph. That's the, that's the most famous instant. instant. And you can imagine uh, a mother seeing a soldier killed at Gettysburg and seeing it and telling, saying, oh, you know, that's my son. It's just 
the facts didn't really fit. But the story, that story was in Charlie Weaver's museum. Do you remember that, Bill? Yeah, I remember Charlie Weaver. They told that story at, in, in front of a little diorama they made of the dead sharpshooter. At if you saw it in Gettysburg, you know it's true. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> and also when I say that dead sharpshooter, Okay, because he's the not, not sharp necessarily shooter right sharp there shooter. is wrong. Yeah, we've got quite okay. a few questions. Okay, First, good. our friend Cliff Bream is asking, how can Mrs. Boardman have have been a guide for twenty years when she's only thirty seven years old? <laughs> Thank you, Cliff. <laughs> I'll send an autograph after we close yes, up tonight. There you go. Um, okay, so a couple of great questions here. Oh, this is a good one for Bill. Who originally misidentified the Rose Farm dead? Have you found what what the earliest reference to that might be? Well, this brings up a a, a fascinating topic. When I was a kid. Uh, the books that dealt with the photographs, uh, by and large, um, were books that were basically biographies or focused on Matthew Brady. And in these books, they actually have Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner working at Gettysburg to, at the same time and actually during the battle. And one of them, they have them, Gardner going out during truce periods and taking these photographs. <laughs> But um, my research was the very first time that anyone actually separated the work of Gardner and Brady and established that they were here almost two weeks apart. And Gardner was the only photographer with his assistants to get here before the dead were buried. Brady didn't get here until almost two weeks later. And um, so uh, I was the, uh, now what was the question again? The question is, uh, what's the earliest misidentification of those? Okay, so yeah, seen? this gets back to my main point. Um, and again, this is intriguing. Alexander Gardner worked for Matthew Brady at the time that the Antietam battlefield was photographed. And what my Antietam book established because it would previously thought again when I was a kid that Matthew Brady had photographed Confederate dead at the first bull run in July of 1861. And I was able to establish that that photograph that was used uh, to document that was a complete fake. And that the very first time that battlefield dead were photographed during the Civil War and in American history was Alexander Gardner's series at Antietam working for Matthew Brady Americans had never seen photographs like that before. And as a result, that Antietam series with the death studies was the received more media attention than any other photographic series during the entire Civil War before or after Antietam. Unfortunately for Gardner, all the credit went to Matthew Brady because they were published as Brady photographs. Gardner, you never see his name mentioned or Gibson's name mentioned. And it was months after that uh, in, the in the spring of 1863, uh, that Gardner left Brady's employ, opened up his own gallery in competition, and took two of Brady's, uh, two of his better best photographers, O'Sullivan and Gibson. And it was Alexander Gardner who got to Gettysburg, got to the Gettysburg battlefield before any other photographers came up from Washington. And there's no doubt in my mind that the reason why he got here so fast is that he wanted to duplicate the drama of the Antietam series, but without seeing Brady's name mentioned all over the place. So he got here so soon that he was the only photographer who had access to actual bodies, but he was here so soon and uh, he was focusing on the dead that he didn't really know the, the famous names on the battlefield. And, as a result, his captions were uselessly vague, and they were basically a harvest of death, dead near the center, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and interestingly enough, Gardner's death study series got absolutely no media attention during, during the war itself. The first time Harper's Weekly used any of them was in 1865. It was a post-war piece, and it was a... Um, uh, uh, um, 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 just a, an illustration. So anyway, um, Brady came up from New York. He got here about two weeks after the battle. 
had he had access to bodies, if there's anyone in the world who would have photographed, focused on the bodies, it would have been Brady. Interestingly enough, he took fabulous panoramas uh, of, of the battlefield, which as historical documents are fabulous. And it's also uh, obvious to me is that Brady was, even though he had galleries in Washington and New York, uh, his, he was based in New York, where Harper's Weekly was actually published. And my sense is that Brady had the connections with Harper's Weekly that got the Antietam series published. And Brady's series was the only Gettysburg series that Harper's Weekly published. Gardner's got no coverage from Harper's Weekly. So um, again, Brady's, uh, Gardner's uh, captions were uselessly vague. And what happened is um, after the war, interest in these photographs de de declined. It wasn't until the 1880s that Century Magazine started doing a series uh, illustrated with uh, engravings based on these photographs. And it's obvious that the, um, the editors couldn't use just vague captions. They were used as illustrations for specific memoirs of the battle. And editors started surmising where these photographs were taken. And my connection is that um, Brady took a fabulous panorama at McPherson's Woods, which is called Reynolds Woods yeah, today. Uh, and you see the woods in the background in a, in a fence. The dead, the uh, that of the um, 24th Michigan shows bodies and there's a dense woods with a very similar fence in the background. And my guess is that an editor, presuming that Brady and Gardner work together, that that's the same fence in the McPherson's Woods photo and just identified that as McPherson's Woods. And, and then the soldiers kind of has a hat. Yes, then that eventually that was considered Iron Brigade 24th. Yeah. So they evolved. Now, once these these crazy captions, well, I'll call them crazy. Once these captions wound up in print, they were never questioned again and nobody knew how to question them. So by the turn, no, actually in the 1890s and especially in 1911 is the first time you have major books actually publishing these photographs as photographs. And they used as the basis of their captions what they saw in uh, the Century Magazine, which became Battles and Leaders of the Civil War. So, and then from then all the way up until the 1950s, when this little 10 year old kid is looking at these photographs, again, no one ever questioned the traditional captions. They didn't know how to question them until this little kid from Long Island came along and <laughs> figured everything out. That's so, amazing. yeah. Okay, so a few questions are very similar. I want to kind of package them together, starting with Sue. Um, what is the photo that has not been discovered yet that you know might have been taken that you would want to see most of all? I didn't phrase that very well, but okay. th this is a question that people are asked, uh, several people have asked, but is there something that you would just love, even if you don't know it, it was ever, you know, in existence, but what would you love to see that you haven't seen before? Something from the first day. Yeah. The first yeah. day is like devoid of images, unless of course someone can connect mm -hmm. the unknown harvest of death images, yes. but that's- and We have about eight questions on that. Do you really? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> unless, I knew that was coming. <laughs> unless the first day, I, it's it's sad how few images there are of the that's first day. That's a great point. Um, and then is there something that's, that's turned up kind of recently that uh, has intrigued you in, you know, in the last five or six years that has come to light, anything? That was the other part of that question. Anything kind of that's been a recent find. The stock house. Yeah. I was thinking that too. The, the stock house image. That was yeah. amazing. The Himes. Right. Seeing it in immediately post yeah. battle. Right. Oh, that Corley. That's a Corley. This is the oh, Jacob, Corley's. The Jacob yeah, stock Jacob, house, yeah. which is a Corley. Uh, is it John Fisher Corley's? Is that his name? Or Samuel, Samuel Fisher. Samuel, Samuel Fisher, Fisher Corley's. Corley's. So, so on South Washington. So I was going to say the point. Part. The point is that of this question of whether the person asking it on you know knows exactly what you know why they're asking is that there are photographers that were here and recorded images on the battlefield, and we know they did, but we are not sure how many images that they recorded or where other images that they recorded might surface or pop up. And that Samuel Fisher Corley's image, 
uh, taken presumably in October of 1863, just appeared on eBay one day about three years ago, and it shows a house on Washington Street with massive artillery damage. And the first time I saw it immediately, it was clear it was a Gettysburg stereo view that was not known to exist prior to it as suddenly appearing. And we know that Charles Himes recorded 20 or 30 images on the battlefield. And if I remember correctly, you have four of them. You've seen four of them. Um, so we know that we know he was active in the Camp Letterman Hospital. We know that he shot photographs around town. And uh, from him, there could be 20 other 1863 images floating around. And uh, somebody might have seen them. They just don't understand that they the rarity of them. Wow. Um, and then, you know, Coralise certainly, certainly recorded other views. And then we have in 1867, Samuel Weaver, gems around the battlefield. Yeah. I think there's a bunch of those that are still out there. I think so and too. that's a good opportunity for first day views that we haven't seen. Unfortunately, the first day is rolling fields. And for the stereo camera, that's not a very interesting subject. It's right. kind of true. No big boulders. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's not cool boulders with uh, in 3D. Yes. What about Let's Bill? Do, do you have something yeah. you love to see? Um, <laughs> I'm sure you do. One of the most famous photographs uh, was the um, uh, the image taken at the dedication of the National Cemetery, <laughs> looking straight on. It actually does show Lincoln on the speaker stand, and it's now um, I surmise in in journey in time. I, I think I had photographer unknown and early photography at Gettysburg, David Bacharach. Uh, is the most likely photographer. And it is inconceivable that he came to Gettysburg and only took one photograph. There's got to be more photographs that he took on November 19th, 1863. And we've never seen any, any of the photographs taken at the dedication ceremony. I've never seen any of them on their original mounts. And getting back to what Tim was talking about, Himes and Corley's, these were not actually... Um, commercial photographers. They belong to um, kind of amateur associations. And so there's no printed catalogs of showing their complete list of photographs. So you never know when something else is going to turn up. Well, and they're very nondescript. If you if you were a descendant and you came upon great great grandpa's picture and all it is is a bunch of heads in a crowd and you didn't know the story, that has no meaning. Right. So you know, they, they may be lurking out there. Absolutely true. Hidden in plain sight. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, with the uh, Weaver, for instance, also um, Samuel Weaver, I should say, uh, Peter Weaver is the one who recorded the 1867 series. I right. should have said Gems Ryan Bill I said Peter. Peter, um, Samuel, his father, who lived in Gettysburg, he recorded some in 1863. And, uh, you know, Bill in his Gettysburg then and now, I forget if it's in the then and now it's or in then the and companion, now, companion uh, show, uh, has a series of uh, ones that we never expected to see uh, taken a devil's den in there. And um, uh, they just appeared suddenly for sale uh, one day, including an image of the slaughter pen showing General Reynolds' family and fiance visiting the battlefield. Um, and so certainly the opportunity for uh, future discoveries is definitely um, you know, out there. And I'm sure there will be future discoveries. Now, in interestingly enough, um, we do have Alexander Gardner's September 1863 catalog. And when I wrote uh, Journey in Time and that came out in 1975, there were still a couple views that were in the catalog that no one had ever seen. Those have been discovered. And I think virtually everything in his 1863 catalog has surfaced. Now, Brady, for instance, besides the stereo views that are numbered and are used later, and we have examples of probably all of those, he also has plate views. And there, for a while, there was a few views that were floating around, and it was unclear if they were Brady views or not. For instance, the one from Stevens Knoll looking towards the town uh, that shows the back of the jail and the German or foreign church. And the, in your first book, the ones that are on uh, East Cemetery Hill at that time were unknown, looking towards the town, the, the panoramic view. So, 
and the Brady view from Little Round Top looking out. Um, you know, these are views that are plate views that are definitely Brady's. There could be other Brady plate views that, like you say, and we don't exist. have a catalog that, and we just don't have them in the catalog, and we don't know they exist. And somebody might have seen them or taking note of them, but just not realize the significance of them. Now, interesting. A lot, I keep saying interestingly enough. Um, it was a, an auction catalog that I got a hold of that had a whole series of Brady plate views. And that was the first time that I discovered that they were actually Brady's because in 1863, both his stereo series and his plate series, interestingly enough, they're not on the mounts or do not have printing. They're actually handwritten descriptions of these things on the stereos and they're very rare today even the stereos the stereos were reissued in 1865 and uh by another firm and they were given actual negative numbers because brady's original stereos didn't have negative numbers and um so anyway uh, you know we, we don't have a, a complete catalog of brady's plates from 1863 and you never know what's going to turn up Next. And I, I should mention just one last thing on that. The New York Public Library digitized their photographic collection about 10 years ago. And upon doing it, there was an article, um, you know, that was all over the Internet about it. And so I went to their site. I put in Gettysburg and I didn't not that I saw different views that I hadn't seen before. They had a collection of views they got, it said, from the United States Sanitary Commission, and they were um, prints made from the original negatives that actually showed more of the image off to the right and left than we had known before. And they had the one from the font stop uh, looking at the font stop. Yeah, looking. Oh, this is Gardner. I'm sorry, they weren't praises. They were gardeners. They were gardeners. But in these Gardner views, you could actually see more than you could in the stereo that was cut down. Yeah. And it was um, fascinating. Uh, so, and, and there were a couple of Camp Letterman views on that site that were, um, oh, and the other thing about that, I, I tell a story that, that reminds you of a story that you often tell, is that a predecessor of ours who was an enthusiast in Gettysburg photographs, William C. Dara, um, told you that the New York Public Library has 1863 views of the Wills House that we've never seen. Really? But they're not. They haven't put on public on our website yet. We only know of one view of the Wills House, and it's much later. Wow. No, but you Has said that's from. Seen that before? Did I mention that in one of my books? <laughs> you you mentioned that. To, um, I didn't know that. That's incredible. Yeah, I think it's a Tyson. Wow. You, you said. This is a long time ago. Okay. okay we got okay. a few more questions. So thank you all. You, this is incredible. We're getting like just tons and tons of questions. We will try our best to answer as many as we can. Um, first, I just want to thank, we've already raised $610 and it keeps going up and up and up. So and with the match, that's over 1200. And thank you so much. We, like I said earlier, we have an 1863 match tonight. So hopefully we can get the full amount and access that full uh, match to help support the preservation of our collection here. Um, so I think we should turn, we're getting a lot of questions about the topic you probably expected. He doesn't know about this. Uh, well, the harvested, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, there is a question. So there's several people commenting about the famous harvest of death views. And for those of you who aren't familiar, this is probably two of the more famous photographs taken of dead on the battlefield. They're clearly union dead, am I right in saying that? Yeah. Um, and uh, we do not know where these two photographs were taken. Um, they're, they're facing different ways, but they show the same group of dead bodies on the battlefield. Um, and there are many theories out there. Um, I'll ask Bill just, just a very quick answer to this. Has the harvest of death been discovered, the site of the harvest of death, to your to your satisfaction. No, not to my satisfaction. <laughs> now, there, there, uh, it was because it was my journey in time that, for the first time, established that the two photos were showed the same bodies. Because right. even Alexander Gardner, when he published them in 1866, he described them as one view as dead Confederates, the other view as dead Union soldiers. So they were never combined together. So this massive investigation began in 1975 and of course i'm the person that people would send their discoveries to and i have over two dozen different sites have been discovered on the battlefield and um i uh, as far as i'm concerned there's not one of the sites is is problem free there's problems with every one of them 
and you won't well i was just going to tim pointed out a good correction there are three photographs not two i, I misspoke well no there's actually th Maybe four, there are four? Okay. There's 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 two, two plates. Two views. Yeah, we should say. There's yeah. one one view looking one way, and one two, view looking two different the other scenes, way. and yeah. the each or is yes. a duplicate. Good reality. clarification, yeah. though. So the questions that we're having, somebody's asking. You know, there was some new uh, a new I guess article that has not come out yet that is yeah, surmising well, that. This okay, site, well, yeah. uh, Bill doesn't really know about this, so let me just say today. <laughs> Today, Savas Beatty's uh, website released, um, I guess it's kind of like an advertisement for a future book that they're planning. And someone claims to found the Harvest of Death site. Did you, are you familiar with this, Sue, today? Yeah. <laughs> um, I am highly um, skeptical. <laughs> Unfortunately, every time the site is discovered, the articles don't say, hey, here's a theory about where this site may be. They say, we found it, it's over, this is it. And this one is very much in that vein. Yeah. Anyway, this, um, this person identifies it as being in front of the Lutheran Theological Seminary looking towards McPherson's Ridge, the one with the burial crews. Well, they that's similar to other several one. other ones that have recently. Yeah, it's another first day's battlefield yeah. thing. And mm -hmm. Bill, how, you think you've probably walked almost 100% of the battlefield looking for this, okay. this site? My, I've checked uh, all 25 square miles. I even been to the East Cavalry Battlefield. And I will say this, that the, the, the site that actually physically comes the closest to a match is actually at McPherson's Woods area on the first day's battlefield. But there are major problems that need to be resolved before we say, in fact, I think people at the park have actually endorsed that as, as the site. And my, my biggest problem of all the problems is the fact that the view supposedly looking northeast um, should show some trace of a major thoroughfare, the Chambersburg Pike. The pike was a major thoroughfare. You should see some of the roadbed. It had fencing on both sides. Some of, uh, one side was post and rail, the other was worm fence. Even if the worm fence was gone and the, po the, the, um, the rails were gone, there should be, uh, the posts okay. should be there. So you said, should see something on this major thoroughfare. In fact, Brady's views taken uh, a couple of weeks later at McPherson's farm you can actually see some of that fencing all intact on the pike in the background. And um, so that has to be resolved. And then there's the other problem is that we know that Alexander Gardner arrived on the extreme Southern portion of the battlefield coming up from Emmitsburg. And he would have gotten here on the fifth. And he got here right in one of the last areas of that were dead remained and he was looking for the dead. So he spent most of his time at Gettysburg on the Southern portion of the battlefield uh, at the Rose Woods. Then um, after that, he took very few views. Uh, he took the Trostle Farm, uh, the Fornestock building in, in Gettysburg, but how he bounced from the Southern part of the battlefield after securing all his death studies to the extreme other side of the battlefield, the three miles away, he had to have passed the Lutheran Theological Seminary, uh, the, the major buildings in town, the Pennsylvania College, Lee's headquarters, which he might not have realized was Lee's headquarters. But anyway, it's kind of odd how he would bounce from one extreme to the other extreme. And um, I would love one of my fantasies is discovering a hidden or lost diary of Alexander Gardner describing exactly how he covered the Gettysburg battlefield. But until someone can explain the complete absence of the trace of a major thoroughfare, which should be in that view, um, that needs to be explained before we could. And the reason I don't want to, I don't want to endorse a scene, a, uh, a site that ha still has problems and put an end to the search. I want the search to continue. Right. Right. And one of the rarest versions of the photographs is, um, the view that's technically identified as the harvest of death, 
Um, I've never seen a really good stereo version of that, even though a stereo version was taken. Have you seen one? I, I've, I've seen one, but it's in very poor condition. No, yeah, it's in very poor shape. Yeah. So I want to keep the search going until we can be conclusive. I, I think maybe people should start looking back on the uh, southern end of the field where it most likely was taken and stop looking on the first deck. That's what I think. But uh, also, I just always like to point out that I, I think there might be like 40 different sites that people have identified as this 40. being the location. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> the ones that are just like put up on the Internet and where people say, yeah, I have it. This is it. And I would just point out, just say, okay, let's say there's 30, 29. Let's say one of these people's right. The other 29 are wrong. <laughs> and I want those people to know that they're wrong. <laughs> and, it, you know, there's no punishment for publishing an article and saying how you, you discovered the site. And there should be. Yeah, some Tim Smith scolding there. <laughs> That's good. Okay, lots more questions. A couple of people touched on something interesting. This, might, this is a good question for Sue, given your research on the cyclorama. People are asking why there were no Civil War or 1863 photographs taken of the Pickett's Charge field in that area. Yeah. It, it just any any thoughts on you know it seems strange that perhaps they didn't yet recognize the significance of that scene or maybe it wasn't you know uh, as aesthetically yeah, pleasing. What, I was what, just going to say it could be because it's just boring. Yeah, I mean it's just a big open field. There's right. nothing. I'm sure it wasn't yet known that the cops of trees may or may not have been Lee's focal point. Right. So, I mean, taking a picture of a vast field is not very interesting. Yeah. And again, Alexander had to have been bodies all over there right. would have been photographed. Right. Right. And um, right. the photographers were looking for photos that would appeal visually to mm -hmm. people. And also my sense is that the cops of trees was not uh, anywhere near as dramatic as it would eventually become. And it was Batchelder. It wasn't until, you know, decades after that Batchelder, it was in the 1870s that he started focusing on the cops of trees as the, the, uh, the point that, you know, and of course, so at the, in 1863, you wouldn't have heard the name Pickett's charge. Would you? Yeah. And it's not accessible. There's no way to get to it. You know, there's no driveway Hancock right. Avenue is not put in until right. 1882 to drive into to the middle and so of you can't get field. to that site how are you going to get there you know you can break down the Emmitsburg Road but still that's you have to go up that hill to get to it you have to get your photographic wagon to that site and that's you know one of the problems about searching for things like the harvest of death and um, you know you have to consider how the cameraman would arrive at that particular site you know, you drive a wagon down the road. Um, are you just going to cross a field? Are you going to cross a stream? Are you going to cross fences? You're going to ride through some woods. You have to have access to the site where the images were taken. And, you know, having said that, I mean, it, I'm sometimes amazed by Gardner's wagon appearing at different locations around Devil's Den and how far he must have had to um, run with his, uh, you know, his wet, plate. wet plates to get them, um, you know, to to treat the, the plate after he exposed the image. But that might be why there's a heavy concentration of images in this locations he selected. Yeah. And, he got 10 on the rose yeah. farm because he was yeah. there. Yeah. And that's, um, I'm, I'm sure there's four taken at Culp's Hill, the wagons in the same place. There's mm -hmm. what now 12, I guess, different, at least at the rose farm at Devil's Den. You know, he probably moves his wagon just a short distance a yeah. few times and and there's multiple views taken. And, and a good example of this is um, uh, the Tyson, the Tyson series in 1867 or the Weaver series in 1867, where you find uh, one stereo image at a location, then turn around and look around. You're going to find another one there, too. They don't just go to one spot, take one image, go to another spot, take another right. image. It's it's such a task to set up the, the wagon and prepare the uh, glass plate and then record it that they take multiple views at the same location. Like Rock Creek. It's common practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's another good question. Before that, I just want to say we, we passed the thousand dollar mark, which is incredible for just right. a few minutes. Good. So there's only, I think, 700 or so dollars left to get us to the full 1863 match, which is such a nice idea from a very generous anonymous donor who's supporting us tonight. So I hope you'll uh, you'll donate if you can with the donate button on the post. Um, a couple great questions here. Um, someone's asking what types of equipment that they would have had in their uh, their wagon, the photographers when they reach the <laughs> battlefield. I know that's a that could 
I have a long answer, but would somebody like to kind of take a, a crack at, you know, what, 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 when you open up the back of this wagon, what would you have seen if you were there with, with Gardner or Brady? Pans, a lot of chemicals and a lot of glass plates. Wow. Yeah. And they, they had to process each negative on the spot mm -hmm. from scratch and then rush it out to the camera, make the exposure and then rush it back. They had about 10 minutes, especially on a, on a hot day that that plate could not dry at any point. And that's why when, when, when um, I mean, modern people were looking at these photos, they're used to traveling around with a 30, well, a 35 millimeter camera back in the old days. <laughs> but you have to understand how cumbersome the wet plate process was. And like what sure. Tim said, they would find a spot where they could set up their dark room. And um, in fact, they often, the horses are not even attached to the wagons that are presumably they're out grazing, but um, that's why they took the photos generally in groups rather than just a single shot. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. And we've got another, this is a really excellent question from Kurt, our friend, Kurt Musselman. Um, what was the first photographic treatment of the battlefield where the photographer was trying to actually achieve documentation of the landscape rather than just taking anecdotal scenes of buildings or, or dead soldiers? That, you know, when, when was the, was there a shift in just photographing for the sake of art and then to actually have his photographs taken to help further historic knowledge of the battlefield? I think Brady question. did that. Yeah, his panoramas are spectacular. Yeah. I can't yes. even conceive of anyone documenting it as well. Right. Now, the fact that he might have in, included an artistic uh, in, you know, yeah. motive in there doesn't detract from the panoramas sure. that he created. Yeah. But he had known some of the name, the place names yeah. by then. Right. And he likely had a guide, unlike Gardner. Yeah, who would the guide would have been a local? We don't know who these guides were, do we, that were taking these photographers around? I've never heard any of them, no. of them right. names. No. And with Gardner, I guess we're talking about, you know, just days. I mean, it, it, who would have even known? It, was it a yeah, he got He got here two two days would after the a, 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 a Union a local, soldier or maybe? a local citizen? I well, guess we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, although right. um, Philip Pateau had Holtzworth, William Holtzworth a local veteran and resident. Wow. And he was a guy. Yeah, he guy. was. And then also, you know, the um, it's obvious just from looking at the Tyson Brothers August 1863 series and the similarity between those and Brady's images that the Tysons probably were with Brady when he recorded yeah. his series. We that's a spec that's some speculation that over the years I, I think Bill I mentioned that yeah. has developed. Yeah. And it, that when know, Brady reached Gettysburg he sought a yeah. local photographer for some yeah. assistance. Right. And we kind of we kind of that narrative is one that we, you know, uh, uh, believe in. Although, you know, again, some of these things are are in speculation uh, on these, you know, these topics. Here's a, a good one too. Our, our good friend Carolyn Sauter's watching, who's the uh, leading the special collections at Gettysburg College. She does a wonderful job there, and she's asked a couple questions. I, I wrote down the first one. I didn't get a chance to ask. Maybe you could answer this one quickly. Um, how long did it take before the famous photograph of the Humiston children was identified after it had been found in the in the I guess in the is it breast pocket or in the hand of the that's the, in Mark Dunkelman. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, our, it was our good buddy Mark Dunkelman wrote a book on this, and he identifies the exact uh, time that it was. Yes, uh, but it discovered. was months. Wow. It was, it was, it wasn't that long though, but it was, you know, as, as, as things go, but. Right. And then Carolyn's other question is. Oh, there... did, did you mention that Mark Dunkelman has a book out on Yeah, it? we should. Yeah. Mark Dunkelman has, the, it's a regimental it's called, history. Uh, or is it just Gettysburg's <laughs> Unknown, Un yeah. Soldier Unknown Soldier. Unknown Soldier. Yeah. It's very Mark detailed. Dunkelman, and he goes into very great detail in the yeah. story. Uh, one thing I do uh, would like to point out that um, for some of the local details, Mark Dunkelman wrote a letter to Dr. Charles Gladfelter here at the Adams County Historical Society. And the whole story of how the photograph got from the body the, of the three children to the doctor who then had it published and wow. then sent around to New York uh, newspapers. It's a great story. There was a tavern involved. Uh, Graffensburg again. <laughs> yeah. The Carolyn's, uh, Carolyn's other question, are there any early photographs that feature the Daughters of Charity from Emmitsburg? Um, not at Gettysburg, mm -hmm. but of course their um, headquarters, you know, in Emmitsburg, uh, Gardner records that on his way here. Isn't it said that they're, like they're in the corner of that view of the procession, that there's two? There are two yeah. um, uh, Sisters of Charity. And one of the interesting things you might know when you read about the Sisters of Charity for Emmitsburg and, and through the course of the American Civil War, hundreds of them served in the hospitals in both the North and the Southern hospitals. <coughs> 
Um, but uh, you might know if you go there and you uh, do the tour of it, they have their nuns. And instead of wearing the black habit, they have a dark blue habit. Huh, and that colorization process right. that we use through my heritage, when we developed that, they, they were blue. They, and is that they, they how brought them out as blue. Is that how they're depicted in St. Francis Church window? Yes, in a blue, in blue habit. And, they, um, and if you look at the Lincoln procession view recorded by uh, the Tysons, in November, on November 19th, looking from near the Jenny Wade house down the street, uh, in one of the views, crowd views, uh, in the very bottom of the photograph, you can see two of the, what we believe are, uh, you know, so they could be nuns living in Gettysburg, I guess, that's at the true. Catholic we don't Church. Really know for sure. But yeah, they're, they're, they're wearing <laughs> this a This is a hat. really excellent question from Timothy York. Curious about the lack Timothy of York. squeamishness of Gardner dragging a body and posing it, and the rose pasture view of a a severed hand being picked up and moved potentially to put next to the body that that's something Good i question. don't know if i've ever thought about Good question. So you were an er nurse for many years what do you think i mean these photographers well, going out and doing these things. Two, two things actually and one is we're talking about an entirely different era of time when life was hard yeah. Life was hard. Children died 50% of the time. People suffered horrible farm accidents and were mangled. We're talking about war here. Yeah. You, I do believe you can be a nerd to that. But the other, the other important point is the one Franz made that uh, he, he, he has a very successful showing of dead bodies at Antietam. So I'm sure he got past any squeamishness to recreate that for Gettysburg. I mean, face it, when there's money behind it, you can do a lot. Right. That's a really good point. Can you imagine the smell? Yeah, when I, no, I can't. Gardner's active on the I battlefield can't. in July. Cannot even imagine. Maybe they had peppermint oil. We know many of the local citizens had masks with peppermint, peppermint oil, oil. To, mm -hmm. to keep back. Well, you know, uh, Andrew, the one gentleman um, asked about... Um, uh, oh, it was Kurt Musselman was asking about, uh, you know, when they went from artists to maybe recording uh, more formal, uh, purposeful recording of history. It was during the Civil War, and I wanted to point out David Russell. Um, Russell is working for the Army. Is that right, Fred? Andrew J. Russell. Andrew J. Russell. <laughs> David Russell's a general in the Sixth Army Corps. Okay. Andrew Russell. Yeah, he was working for the Army. So they hired him and I've seen some of his album is like bridges so mm -hmm. they can get an idea of how the bridges are constructed or, um, you know, their photographs uh, for documentation purposes, other than just uh, cameramen shooting images to sell in the artistic market. I think George Bernard did a little bit oh, of that Bernard, in yes. the okay. Southern Theater. Is that it? Okay. Yeah, George and Bernard. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, we have lots of questions, so we'll see if, what the next one might be. Here's a good one for, for Bill. Um, a couple questions to this effect. Someone's asking if you would ever do another book, and uh, a follow-up to that, have you ever reconsidered doing a reprint of one of your first two books with modern photos of today? Um, my first book came out in 1975 when I was 28, and my last and seventh came out when I was 50 years old in 1997, and I won't be doing any more books. <laughs> I just turned 75. And interestingly enough, um, I took the modern photographs for Gettysburg, A Journey in Time a couple months after, or several months after I got back from Vietnam. And so that's in the late 1971. And it's interesting today, the, the whole concept of time has fascinated me. But if you were born in 1996, uh, 1971 doesn't seem very modern to you. <laughs> and it's in, targeted. increasingly <laughs> fascinating me that the, the quote, modern photographs, unquote, in Journey in Time, actually have historical value sure. in themselves yeah. Yeah. so if, I, if someone did another book they should not replace the old modern photographs and uh for example there's a uh, in fact i was just mentioning this the other night to somebody who was asking about the trees on the battlefield uh one of my modern photographs in uh taken on little round top in 1971 shows this massive tree on top of the hill which the same tree is you can see it as a younger tree in the 1863 photographs and that tree is long gone 
So the modern photograph from 1971 has value in itself. So the battlefield is a constantly evolving thing. And uh, even areas like they get cleared off, like the slaughter pen, you know. It's growing back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would never, ever replace the modern photographs in any of my books because they have historical value in themselves, documenting the period in which the books came out. Right. right. A, a great story is the DeRose Farm series that we're talking about. And I guess now, have we increased it to 12, 12 views yeah. of 44 bodies, yeah. something like that? Uh, that when they were recorded, that place was an open field. But when Bill recorded the modern photographs, mm -hmm. and as he said, 1971, uh, that was wooded, heavily wooded. And I remember the first time I, with my friends, had Bill's book in the 1970s. And this probably was five years after you had taken those modern photographs. We were at the Rose Farm site and we were trying to line up one of the views and we could not do it using the older view. So we were cheating and we were using Bill's modern <laughs> photograph to find the site. And there was a fence post in the view and we just couldn't find it. And then suddenly I stepped on something and I looked down and the fence post had fallen on the ground and this was just five years after your modern, and the fence in your view wasn't even there anymore. So um, yes, it, uh, it, it can be problematic uh, using the modern photographs. And, and uh, if he does replace the modern photographs in his old book, then in 10 years from now, somebody else will want him to replace them again. So that would be an issue also. So if we if we had them do it in, in 2025, they'd be 50 years and we have yet, you know, it'll be a it'll serial, be, yeah. we serial photograph. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had a couple questions earlier about preservation of the battlefield and how this all kind of dovetails in this, this research that Bill has done. Um, can you speak to, I'm sure all of you could speak to this, but these discoveries that were made, knowing the location has allowed the National Park Service and its partners to, to restore parts of the battlefield to actually get them back to the the, the, the appearance that they had in 1863. Is there one, I think, Bill, maybe we could start with you. Is there one thing you're really proud of that has resulted from your discoveries? Yeah, um, when I was a battlefield guide, uh, when I was going to Gettysburg College, 1966 to 68, uh, the only restoration work that was done on a regular basis was uh, every few years, they clear off the Western face of Little Round Top because everyone knew that was open and the foliage grows quite rapidly up there. But when my book came out, uh, people were amazed at how overgrown portions of the battlefield were, but the, the portion that the park was most sensitive about was uh, the slaughter pen. You would not have heard the word slaughter pen uh, when I was a battlefield guide. The, the only time you would ever see that word it was associated with the photograph that was identified as slaughter pen at the base of little round top and nobody i remember dr Fons was mentioning to me he couldn't find any of those rocks i tried to find them on little round top and it wasn't until um february 1st 1967 that i discovered the key rocks and the slaughter pen was not at the base a little round top, it was at the base of big round top, which was completely overgrown. Now, when you would go through a tour around Devil's Den, uh, there was never any focus on the left side of the road because it was completely overgrown in the creek, everything was overgrown. All the focus was on the big boulders and the sharpshooters. So when my book came out in 1975, uh, that was the area the park was most sensitive about restoring um, because it was the most heavily visited portion of the battlefield that was completely overgrown. Now, unfortunately, um, this led to a big controversy. And um, what the park, by the 1980s, they had a plan. I think Kathy George Harrison had done a, a detailed study of the slaughter pen and their plan was to get rid of the road through Devil's Den and build another road along the old trolley bed in, in, inside the woods. And that was very controversial. I was even against that because I was afraid they were going to destroy other boulders. And um, some of those boulders, it turned out, were how, we, how I discovered the uh, 
some, some of the other slaughter pen photographs. So anyway, um, I, from my personal experience, I see my journey in time and specifically the slaughter pen restoration project as the beginning of a new era in the park, returning to or trying to return portions of the battlefield, again, now having photographs to use as documentation. So uh, the slaughter pen discovery is, uh, and the Rose Farm discovery were the two I'm most proud of. Wow, that's great. And we have a couple of questions related to Bill's work. Um, one person just asking, how do we get your books? And I think they're all, most of them are on Amazon. Is that correct, I think? Um, well, interestingly, <laughs> My uh, publisher, my, well, my original publisher was Charles Scribner's Sons uh, out of New York, and they dealt nationwide. Then they were eventually when uh, were replaced by another publisher in 19, uh, I, eventually I wound up with Thomas Publications, the local Gettysburg, and uh, they went out of business. Now my books are um, actually published by, uh, it's called Americana Souvenirs and Gifts, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And um, we still use the same printers out in the Midwest. In fact, my early photography has been out of print and we're, we have a new printing that should be coming out in a few weeks. But unfortunately, this new distributor basically deals distributing to gift shops and stores locally. Mm. So they're not available nationwide and he, they don't do business online. In fact, just the other day, I mentioned someone, my early photography at Gettysburg and they went online and they saw copies for $200 wow. a piece. Well, I think maybe the Americana Souvenirs website might be, you might have to call, but you can get the listing and call. And, well, and but there are most, uh, many of the, uh, the shops in Gettysburg like the American uh, Heritage Center. Yeah, Heritage yeah Center. they have my books. Someone told me they were out at the park and they didn't see any of my books at the park bookstore. Well, the park doesn't really have a bookstore. It's uh, run by um, what's the event name? Network. Event Network. It's um, so it's a it's a complicated process. Yeah. Yes. Right. A couple more questions here. Thank you, Bill. Um, and thank you also. We're it's incredible. I we're just going up and up and up. I think there's only five hundred or so dollars left to reach our full match, uh, eighteen sixty three. So if you can chip in and hit the donate button, we'd really appreciate it. Um, uh, let's see. The next question here uh, is this one. Oh well, this is a one that is very pertinent. Someone's asking about the Sphinx rock on Big oh, Round yes. Top, and maybe, maybe I don't Bill know, know about that. Bill may not know. <laughs> Would you like to share the news of so? Uh, so Bill, and uh, as far as we know, this happened on uh, August, uh, some somewhere between August 2nd and August 10th of this year, a tree fell on Big Round Top and hit the Sphinx and knocked it over. Oh, really? So we're talking about a natural rock formation on the backside, east side of uh, Big Round Top where multiple rocks are stacked on top of each other and erosion is taking place and the rock formation sort of is balanced like the Sphinx of Egypt. And uh, there's a lot of, of uh, there's an 1867 photograph of it by mm -hmm. the Weavers. There's a um, 1890s, it appears in the park, um, uh, uh, what do you call that? The uh, commission book in the one of the report. photographs, yeah. and it's referred to as the Sphinx, and there's newspaper articles about it. But it's a it's a formation of rock that has been standing for millions of years, and a tree hit it, and it is no longer there. Wow! Yeah. But there, there, so, right there, is the reason why Gettysburg photography is so important. That's right. But forget about the fact that you can't visit it anymore. We have a photograph of it. <laughs> and, you know, this also brings up an interesting issue that I mentioned, especially to eighth graders on the most every tour I give. Devil's Den is not going to be there. That, you know, that table rock on Devil's Den is just barely resting on the rocks below it. And that, one day it will fall. Does that have anything to do with some of your fun eighth grade tours yeah. where you put half the group under the rock yeah, and I, half I, on the I, other side? I, I, have have to, I have the kids push it. See yeah. if you can push that over. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no. Now, just wait like 500 <laughs> times. And it may not fall tomorrow. It may be 500 million years from now. Yes. But one day. One day. That 
Brad Rock. What Real a shocker that will be. We should point out our new museum is going to have an exhibit that starts with the, the yeah, we geology have, of Devil's Den and all these rock yeah. formations. So if you're curious about the yeah. science behind it and all and, the photographs that have been taken of these rock formations, we're going to yeah. cover that in and our new museum. Andrew, I'm sure, way. Andrew, if you think about it, you might remember this. We have a photograph of the Sphinx in that display yes. when you walk in. Yes, we Immortalizing do. it. <laughs> yes, we do. That's great. Um, we're, we're just about done. I want to just ask a couple more questions before we wrap up. There's been so many amazing questions. We haven't had a chance to, to get cover all of them. Um, but uh, two of them, one from our friend Cliff Freeman, another that just came in. What areas of the battlefield would you prioritize in terms of um, what is left to be uh, revitalized and rehabilitated to return the landscape to 1863? What what would you like to see in terms of the next steps? There's been a wonderful project to rehabil rehabilitate Culp's Culp's Hill, Hill. Yeah. Um, and, and it's really impressive. And I think people are wondering, you know, what what should be next? What That's not done yet. That was, right? that was such a, what was done on Culp's Hill was such a small part of what needs to be done right. to actually understand that battle. That is sure. one of the toughest parts of this battle to understand. Yeah, that's a great point. And a lot of his view shows. Well, we hope, we'll hope the park will continue to do that because yeah, it has do. really opened up a lot of uh, opportunities for visitors. Yeah. What about well, I, I say a little round top. I mean, I, I think that the best thing we can do as historians is pull together all these photographs and con constantly explain to people what the photographs tell us about the battlefield at the time of the battle. Now, I think one of the problems that, um, um, you know, it's hard between the historians and, and uh, park officials is we might only have 1880s photographs of a site and they want to see July 1863 evidence. But for instance, I have an 1880s photograph that shows, you know, from Corley's that shows that it's much clearer around uh, the uh, new southern uh, slope of Little Round Top. And I think Bill mentions this in his uh, Journey in Time in one of the photographs looking straight south from the summit, that the trees need to be pulled back uh, near yeah. to the Sykes Avenue. And then, you know, years ago, um, and I'm going to guess like 10 years ago, the park kind of stopped the tree, the massive tree clearings yes. on the battlefield. And one thing I was so looking forward to, and it hasn't been done yet, there's an 1863 Brady stereo view from the summit of Little Round Top looking north to across the Wakert Farm to the angle. And it's taken from the rock in front, you know, the, the rock with the signal core plaque on it in front of um, General Warren statue. And if you look, it is clear north all the way up to uh, the angle. And um, the park did some clearing on that slope of the hill, but there is a line of trees along the Wheatfield Road and it's only like 20 or 30 of them. And those trees are still there. If those trees were removed, we would once again open up that particular view north and, um, you know, I think Little Round Top is a place where we, I, I think, and I would think, I, I would say this, that the reason I, I think it's important for us to educate people on what we know about the Civil War photographs and what they tell us about the battlefield is that I think that people don't want to clear Little Round Top to the extent that we know it was cleared because they believe it would be too shocking for the visitor to, wow. You know, did they go too far? That sometimes, you know, you think you go too far in these clearing right. projects. Right. And, uh, but this is one where we have pretty good documentation. That's, uh, that's also, you know, um, Gettysburg is fortunate. And here I am paraphrased from some of the things in uh, Bill's book, but we have the Warren map of the battlefield, the most detailed map of any Civil War battlefield drawn within years of the fighting. And then we have, uh, hundreds of photographs are recorded during the 1860s, during the decade of the battle, that give us an idea of a great portion of the field and how it appeared during the decade of the battle. And um, I just think it's important to use those resources in our rehabilitation of the battlefield. I think part of that, though, is that there's, and I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase this because I'm not Park Service and I don't want to speak on their behalf, but there was they prioritized 
heavy fighting area, moderate fighting sure. area, light yeah. fighting area, yeah. and they only concentrated on the one. So you don't see a lot of battle stories that happen on the north slope of Little Round Top that would have had those trees you know, involved in them. So I think that would take a lower priority, but I agree hundred percent. I want a hundred percent rehab. Yeah. But that's, you know, <laughs> that's what we yeah. do. And I think we understand that, you know, there's, there's limited funds and right, there's right. limited resources. And well, and there's long-term maintenance and long-term well. and long-term maintenance. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we'll end with a question that was asked very early in the program. Um, it was asked of Bill, so maybe we could have Bill start. What sparked your interest in Civil War photography? And I know you touched on it a little bit, but was there was there a moment that really sparked your interest that you can remember from your early, early days? Um, actually, um, if, if you go online in 2011, I gave a two hour and 45 minute talk with 100 illustrations describing how I got interested in all of this. Um, and that's online. You Google Frasinito Image of War Seminar. And, um, but anyway, um, it was a, a Life Magazine article, the September, September 12th, 1955 issue of Life Magazine uh, had an article on the Civil War. And that first sparked my curiosity. And um, I had uh, just turned nine. I was, uh, uh, well, I was about to turn nine. I just started the fourth grade. And um, then I got a, a, a book uh, the following uh, Lincoln's birthday, February of 56. But the, the, the key was um, in April of 1956, uh, we used to visit my uncle and aunt and cousins down in, in uh, Catonsville, Maryland. And it turned out my uncle was a Civil War buff. When he found out his little nine-year-old nephew he was getting interested in the war, uh, he said, well, you know, Gettysburg isn't very far from here. Would you like to visit the battlefield? And I'm sure my eyes opened up wide. So he took me on my first trip to Gettysburg and it would have been Easter, April 1st, I think 1956. But again, that following September um, for my birthday, my mother took me into uh, a, a bookstore in, in New York City. And that's where I saw this book called Divided We Fought. And uh, that was the, my first exposure to the Civil War photographs. And in that book, in the, in the preface, they paid homage to the, the, the grandfather of all Civil War photographic books was the 10 volume in, uh, get, um, photographic history of the Civil War, Miller's photographic history, which had originally come out in 1911. They said it had like 3,800 photographs and that it would probably remain out of print indefinitely. And I remember fantasizing whether I would ever get a, a chance to look at, at that series. I know my elementary school library didn't have it. Well, as it turned out, um, by Christmas of 1957, uh, Thomas Yosloff Company, for the first time since the book came out in 1911, uh, republished it. And that's what I got from my birthday. And for the first time, I was able to see other, other photographs that I could compare with the photographs that I saw in Divided We Fought. And that's when these questions started arising in my mind that set me off on this, this detective story. That's amazing. Yeah. What about you, Sue? Um, I was really interested in Gettysburg, but to be honest, and I, I'm sure a lot of people struggle with this, is that it's really difficult to put your knowledge to the ground. Yeah. I couldn't visualize. I struggled to visualize. And then I bought <laughs> this. <laughs> this is the book that helped me pass the guide test. Gettysburg, a journey in time. Gettysburg, a journey in time. I heard Phil telling somebody in the Farnsworth house about 10 years ago, I was in the bar and he pointed down, he says, she came here because of me and he's pretty close to being right. <laughs> oh, and we got in. That's great. Uh, Tim, I met him when he was 16 years old, wow. and he, he uh, found out I was going to be at a place in Hershey. You must have met me around the same age. That's well, you, how old were you? And I don't remember the year. Do you remember? Yes, yeah, you were 14. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But Tim, you had my 
Antietam. Antietam book. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. And uh, he found out I was going to, so I, I met, I, I didn't remember him, but I knew I had met somebody and I signed his book for him. And then years later, when yeah, he was, you still have the book. Mm -hmm. And of course, and, and yeah. Gary Edelman was in high school and he came across this Antietam book in the library and it changed wow. his life. So that's amazing. What about you, Tim? What, what's your earliest? Well, I mean, for photographs wise, it's a, uh, it's, it's, I mentioned view masters. Mm -hmm. So I was really interested in the process of the 3d image. And then, you know, at some point I realized that the Viewmaster didn't invent this, that this was a stereo view and that people used stereo viewers and looked at stereo cards. So what did I do? I went to a flea market as a teenager and I bought a stereo viewer. And then I started amassing a massive collection of World War I stereos. Oh, wow. Because you could get them for like 25 and 50 right. cents. And so I have still have a massive collection of World War I stereo cards. But then I realized that there's 80 stereo cards recorded in 1863 by, or 1867 by C.J. Tyson. Of course, you know, um, some of them are in your Gettysburg Journey in Time book. And flea markets around Gettysburg had them at reasonable prices. Reasonable, the key word. So no I started to reasonable. buy stereo views at the Gettysburg Battle. And then, of course, William Tipton reproduced stereo views. And um, I really was interested in that whole process. And, you know, what, what's really interesting, and Gary, I think, last at this, and I'm not a photograph collector. I bought stereo cards I took the stereo cards, put them on my viewer and walked around the battlefield with them and dropped them in mud puddles and stepped on them. <laughs> took them out in the rain. <laughs> and took them out. Yeah, I used the stereo images to find the locations of the photographs. And, and you might think this is silly. Why don't I just take a photograph from them? And I just wanted to point this out to the young people watching that. <laughs> Let me give an example. There is a photograph in the Adams County Historical Society collection uh, about of a rock, and it says Colonel John Wheeler killed July 2nd, 1863. I wanted to find that location. So I came to the Historical Society. I brought a light stand. Oh my I had a camera with <laughs> contact lenses on it to blow it up. And then I put it on there and I shot an image of it. And then I had to take the roll of film to a photographic developer. <laughs> and then I had to wait a few days and then I had to get the photograph and then I got the print of it. And then I was able to go out on the battlefield and find the location of the rock. It was a tedious process. I couldn't just whip my phone out and take an image of it. <laughs> and so there was more to it than there is you know, now. And, and at that time, it was easier for me to take the original photograph out in stereo. Now, what I didn't realize is how much of an advantage I had doing that, because I'm looking at the photograph in 3D. And if you haven't looked at these stereo images in their original format in 3D, it's spectacular. You can see depth, you can see rocks, you can, you can see the terrain. And that's what's missing. Uh, with a lot of these people that search for these photographs and mm -hmm. only have just a flat, a flat version of them. You can't see the depth and how far things are away. It, it's addicting. That's why the basis of my collection are stereo views. Now, those guys are true collectors. They, and the Historical Society is a, a collection. But, um, and they've got some here that yeah, are to die yeah, for. Yeah, and we're excited to display those too. We are working really hard on putting a new museum together. And actually, you're looking at the museum team here on, on camera tonight. We have uh, um, Bill's helping out, Sue is helping tremendously, and uh, Tim is the lead writer for the whole thing. So we're going to have a lot more to say about that over the next few months. We've actually finished our first new building. Uh, it's just a storage facility out at our site north of town. And we're going to be moving artifacts into that facility starting next week. Um, it's been 10 years that they've been packed away in large wooden crates out at a warehouse. And these are thousands of items from the Historical Society collection. We have no idea what we're going to discover. And we'll be sharing all of that with you. And I, I just want to thank everybody again for joining tonight. It's pretty funny. I think we are like $30 from 1863 <laughs> right now. Um, so if somebody wants to put us over the, the edge here at the, the last few seconds, we, we'd love that. Uh, asking for donations isn't 
are my favorite thing to do, but it's what we have to do because this collection is just so important and the stories that we, we want to share are so important and we can't forget them. So thank you for joining us tonight. I'm actually going to have to get up to turn off the camera, um, but, but we really appreciated having your, your attention tonight and we're going to keep doing these programs as much as we can and maybe we can even convince Bill to come out and do another program like this uh, <laughs> at some point not too long from, from now. So have a good night, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for supporting the Adams County Historical Society. Good night. Thank you.